we are live. Welcome to 2004's Incre The Incredibles Review and Thoughts film. Nope, this is not a review of any of the tie-in video games. Let's be honest, if I owned one of them, I would probably do videos on. Daz did a great video going into the main one and a little of the other ones, so yeah, and in general, he's done, he, he did a couple of videos, I think at least two videos, on this movie specifically, they're great. You should watch them. So yeah, this movie, it's, it's amazing. It's every bit as excellent as you thought it was if you watched it, or heard it was if somehow, like me, you hadn't watched it before now. Did you, did you expect that I somehow was the one person who realized that it's secretly bad? Yeah, okay, so there are a few reviews, some voted as useful, that are both negative and reasonable. Oh, you sly dog, you got me monologuing, I can't believe it. What, there's no one else here, this is technically a monologue. I realize this video is long, I'm gonna do what I can to make it worth your time. Also, if you're only interested in the review, that part of the video is not the whole length of the video to see its length, check the time codes in the description box. So, content warning and or trigger warning, this movie features and or brings up to the following, and I'm going to be discussing at least some of the following potentially triggering content. Vigilantism, torture, kidnapping, ableism, gaslighting, murder, body horror, and I guess that... And objectivism. So, the movie is rated PG, and so is this video. I'm going to be, I'm not going to be too explicit when I discuss the more adult stuff. But yeah, the, the I, I could not find, the, the MPAA did, apparently didn't write exactly why they rated this PG rather than G, which, you know, a lot of animated, you know, maybe especially Disney Pixar stuff is rated G. And yeah, actually, according to MDB Trivia, this is the first Pixar film to be rated PG by the MPA. All of the company's previous films were rated G. But yeah, there are definitely some some things in this movie that like really small children shouldn't see like if I personally had to I would maybe say 10 years old is if, if certainly if you're going to show this movie to someone who's younger than 10 I would recommend you watch through it first or failing that at least read the IMDb parents guide and I've also seen critics say that it is more mature than the Pixar animated movies that came out before it. Now, whether this is a movie that you love or hate, I don't have a problem with you. I don't think that, you know, people who... Yeah, if you hate this movie, I don't think that you're just some... that, that you necessarily are someone who hates people who disagree with you, hates people who have different values than you. If you express a point of view that you know, goes against something I say in this video. The only thing I ask is that you keep it respectful, and I will answer respectfully. If you write something hateful, whether it's directed towards me or anyone else, I'm most likely just going to ignore you. And let's see, that brings... Right, so I'm currently dealing with some pain in my back and neck, but I still have a lot to say about the movies that I watch, so I might at least in some parts of this video speak faster until my back feels better. And... I... I start this video with a review, most likely with zero spoilers. If I spoil anything, then I will verbally warn before I do so and hold up this paper while I do it so you can mute and skip ahead until you see me take this down. And, you know, once I get into the thoughts section, there will be spoilers without warning. You know, I'll, I'll put up a permanent tag for that, but yeah, tons of spoilers for this movie. 
Not for the sequel, not for any other movie. And yes, in several weeks' time, I will be doing the sequel. And yeah, so briefly, my background with, you know, I read comics between 99 and 2007. I was especially fond of Spider-Man and the X-Men, especially Wolverine. I did read other... I, I, I read more Marvel than DC, but I do think DC also had some really great comics as well. And... Yeah, the, the, you know, since I don't have, you know, I watched this on Disney Plus, so I don't have a physical copy. I just tried to put some animated, you know, yeah. Th that book is the collection of the best Spider-Man stories ever, you know, committed to comics. And a Spider-Man video game and the Into the Spider-Verse. That was the closest I could get to something that, yeah. And I will openly admit, I don't watch that many anime. <laughs> Come to think of it, I could have picked something animated. But most of the animated movies that I own are anime, which I this movie is not that similar. To, I would I would argue it's closer to to what I put up there than yes. I will openly admit, I don't watch that many animated movies. I think they're taking critical skill to create. I have great admiration for the countless talents who work in that field. But I just have a hard time watching something that's animated, that's not live action. It has nothing to do with quality. It's just not really for me. Meanwhile, it's not like I watch absolutely nothing. I watch every Disney animated movie released up to and including Tarzan. They're not equally good, but they're good or better than good. Other than that, I quite like Titan AE, Don Bluth's Anastasia. I've watched most of Hayao Miyazaki's movies. They are all amazing, obviously. For those who very badly want to know, the ones I haven't watched are The Castle of Cagliostro, Norsica and the Valley of the Wind, Conan the Future Boy, and The Wind Rises. The anime Akira is one of the best things ever made by human hands, and the manga is as well, which I did read before watching, for those who care about that. Also, subs not dubs, all the way. With that said, now you have a better idea of my experience with animated movies. The main reason I am doing a video on this is because it is a comic book movie, but I have been looking forward to it. You know, I... My excuse used to be that I didn't really have access to it, but now I have Disney+, Plus, so... You know, if it's on Disney Plus and I think it might be interesting for me to talk about, I'm going to do a video on it. And I, I suppose it's also worth saying I have not watched the sequel yet, but I do know most things there, is to, there are to know about it. I heard spoilers before I even knew for sure I was going to watch. I was ever going to watch these two movies. You know, I only got Disney Plus like January last year. And I only decided, like, maybe half a year ago that I was going to do a video on this at all. And let's see the... Yeah, so there are several major appeals of comic books, video games, and adaptations of them, and stuff heavily inspired by them. One of them is they can have many wild concepts, have them play off each other. And, yeah, this, you know, this has superpowers versus, like technology like you know there are these uh, I don't want to spoil too much but there are some really impressive techno technological threats in this movie and we have superpowers fighting against those and with their wild concepts they can give compelling commentary on real issues of greater efficiency than non-comic stuff and this one definitely does that yes the the commenting on like the the nuclear family and the the roles of the different members of the nuclear family are yeah there's some really great commenting on that in this and yeah this video is not going to contain any clips of any kind the most visual gets is when i sometimes act something out 
So feel free to watch something visual like clips from the movie in another tab. I won't mind. I mean, won't mind. I won't even know, of course. I'm not spying on you right now. I didn't send someone out to stalk you and other supers. So yeah, I streamed this. I didn't pay anything extra to watch it. So anything negative you say in this video is not out of bitterness. I don't feel like the movie wasted my time. Nobody forced me to watch it or to make this video. And it's not that I'm upset at how it compares to other movies like it, what I was expecting, the trailers, no marketing. I don't have some personal vendetta against anyone who worked on making it to the best of my ability. The negative things I say in this are fair criticisms based on budget, when it came out, what it was trying to achieve, etc. So that brings us. Since we're still dealing with Corona, I want to say during this video, it is possible that I will touch my face. I want to assure you, I washed my hands since the last time I was outside, and I will wash my hands again before going out. So yeah, this is my first viewing of this movie, and between me, like, watching the entire movie and now recording this, like, very little time has passed, so it is very fresh in my memory. But yeah, I did know a lot of spoilers before going in to it so you know there, there are definitely some things in this that you know where if you I, I can definitely say more about it because I knew a lot going in so the plot set maybe in the 50s uh, 60s that Brad Bird adores lawsuits mean that supers or people with superpowers, heroes with superpowers, have to retire. Fifteen years later, Bob Parr and his wife Helen are both tired. <laughs> yeah, it's especially him who's who's tired. I mean, she's, she's adjusting better than he is. To normal suburban life with three kids, Teen Violet, Bart Simpson, no, Dash, who's about ten, and infant Jack-Jack. Which I'm not entirely sure we've seen in any other comic book adaptation, regardless of medium. But then, Bob is contacted by someone who has something important for him to do. And... Yeah, so I have not watched very much other Pixar. I've seen Ratatouille, which is a 7, and that's apparently also Brad Bird. He's... Tremendously talented, clearly. I watched Monsters, Inc., which is an 8. And I watched Toy Story 1, which is a 7. And... Yeah, so... The words, this movie teaches valuable lessons, will sometimes get a very well-earned primal fight-or-flight response. It's so often ham-fisted. A lot of the time, even the children are barely tolerating how patronizing the movie's being. But this movie really does a great job at integrating the lessons well. It doesn't feel like it's telling you how to be or behave. And at this point, I must say I completely disagree with the reading of the film that says that it is objectivist, a.k.a. the ridiculous philosophy put forth by Ayn Rand, who, beyond being a terrible writer, was just an awful person, trying to ensure that the government helped the needy as little as absolutely possible, whilst herself hypocritically living off welfare. I very rarely say that someone is lazy. In my opinion, the word lazy usually is an excuse to to show to, to show no empathy towards people who suffer from depression, anxiety, feel a lack of purpose. Those tend to be the things keeping people from either doing anything or or from pulling putting in the full effort consistently. But she was legitimately a lazy person. She refused to actually do work. And a lot of the things that she preached have ended up being made into law because her work appeals to soci sociopaths. And there are a lot of sociopaths in government because they like the power. Renegade Cut made a video specifically talking about this movie and her philosophy. He does a great job explaining it. From, you know, most most of what he says, I will just, you know, I'll tell you to 
watched the video. I rewatched it very recently. You know, he made it years ago, but it still holds up. The one thing, you know, I will just briefly repeat. If the movie was really promoting Ayn Rand, then the good guys would be selfish, but they're actually altruistic. Ayn Rand specifically said that altruism was, I, I want to say she said it was like weakness or a sign of weakness, some, something like that. And Wisecrack also did a video explaining why the movie is not objectivist. So that brings us to the writing. Now, this was written by Brad Bird. The only other movies I've seen that he's written are Ratatouille and Mission Impossible 4. And yeah, so the. You know, as others have noted, this is easily the best Fantastic Four movie we've gotten so far, although, you know, up until this point, the other ones have been pretty bad. You know, the MCU version will be good. It's, I don't doubt that for a second. But, yeah, like, this movie actually really properly understands the family dynamics are key to the appeal of the Fantastic Four. You know, I, I don't hate everything about the version made by, blanking on his name, Josh Trank, but without a doubt, this, yeah, he really, the, his approach to the Fantastic Four was completely wrong. So, quoting some fellow critics, the movie does a good job going back and forth between being dramatic and funny. And... Right, also, yeah, I wanted to quote some IMDb trivia. Brad Bird got the idea for this movie in the early 1990s, basing the story on his own experiences trying to balance a career with family. And... Yeah, the John Lasseter tried to coax Brad Bird to come and join him in 1995 when Pixar was working on A Bug's Life. Bird declined when he left 20th Century Fox. Lasseter asked again. Bird turned him down again as he had a contract with Warner Brothers to make The Iron Giant, which I hear is amazing. If I get access to it, I, I really don't want to have to pay very much money for it. But, you know, if, I mean, I suppose it's unlikely it'll ever show up on Disney Plus since it's Warner Brothers. It, anyway, however, when Warner Brothers failed to properly promote the film, Bird finally agreed to join Pixar. Lasseter had only one request for his friend, make the film you've been dying to make. As Bird has, had been sitting on the idea of making a cartoon about a family of superheroes for over a decade, this movie was the natural choice. The movie's line, you sly dog, you got me monologuing, was voted at was voted as number 15 of the 100 greatest movie lines by Premiere in 2007. Brad Bird drove his team hard to be as creative as possible, insisting on greater attention to details and characters than any other previous Pixar production. The teams responded by pumping the film full of references and in-jokes, one of the most noticeable being the villain syndrome being modeled on Bird. And now I can't unsee that. I did not know that until I started researching for this video. But yeah, you know, I've I've seen a couple of interviews. One hundred percent. They they, yeah. I mean, it's a it's a cartoonified version. But yeah. Also, this is apparently the only Pixar film written by only one person. Brad Birdett has stated that the movie is in part inspired by the comic books of Jim Steranko, whose work on Nick Fury, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. tackled a similar spy espionage genre. And according to Wikipedia, Roger Ebert gave the film three and a half out of four, writing that the film alternates breakneck, breakneck action with satire of suburban sitcom life and is another example of Pixar's mastery of popular animation. So, yeah, quoting some fellow critics, in some ways, a satire with parody of superhero stories and their cliches, they do a really great job of that. Like, if it was really, like, mean-spirited parody, I would 
have absolutely hated this film, but no, it's clearly, it comes from a place of love. You know, they, they didn't just, it's, it's not that they just really hate comic books and wanted to make fun of them. The, it's, it's very clearly a, a tribute. This is Pixar's, right, returning to critic, re, critic quotes. This is one of Pixar's best, knocking off the first Toy Story. It slightly skewers the classic comic book movie and action movies in general, all while being hilarious and fun. Incredibles is truly one of Pixar's greatest achievements, as it not only provides thrills and beautiful animation, but it successfully bridges the gap between child and adult entertainment. Incredibles is aptly named. It tells the surprisingly relatable story it intends to tell in a time and place that feels unique from our own yet approachable. And, yeah, so, plot twists. The movie does a really great job. There are not too many. None of them are bad. There aren't too few, and they aren't too easy to figure out for the viewer. Just, yeah, some really memorable twists in this. And the, yeah, that brings us to the direction. And this was directed by Brad Bird, and, again, the only two... Others that I've seen that he directed are Ratatouille and Mission Impossible 4. Now, Brad Bird describes the movie as using the mundane and the fantastic to contrast each other. And, you know, that's part of why the supers are taken down by lawsuits. And so, yeah, there's some stuff I wanted to quote from Wikipedia. The Incredibles as a concept dates back to 1993 when Bird sketched the family during an uncertain point in his film career. Personal issues had percolated into the story as they weighed on him in life. During this time, Bird had signed a production deal with Warner Brothers Feature Animation and was in the process of directing his first feature, The Iron Giant. Approaching middle age and having high aspirations for his filmmaking, Bird pondered whether his career goals were attainable only at the price of his family life. He stated consciously, this was just a funny movie about superheroes, but I think that what was going on in my life definitely filtered into the movie. After the box office failure of The Iron Giant, Bird gravitated toward his superhero story. He imagined it as an homage to the 1960s comic books and spy films from his boyhood, and he initially tried to develop it as... A 2D cell animation, when the Iron Giant became a box office bomb, he reconnected with old friend John Lasseter at Pixar in March 2000 and pitched this story, his story idea to him. Bird and Lasseter knew each other from their college years at Cal Arts in the 1970s. Lasseter was sold on the idea and convinced Bird to come to Pixar, where the film could be done in computer animation. The studio announced a multi-film contract with Bird on for 2000. Incredibles was written and directed solely by, by Brad Bird, a departure from previous Pixar productions, which typically had two or three directors and as many screenwriters with a history of working for the company. In addition, it would be the company's first film in which all characters are human. And the when, when a filmmaker brings in personal issues into a story and makes it very much about personal issues, there is a risk of it becoming like a bad therapy session and becoming like nasty and just like you can tell that you know the the person making this is just like taking out their frustrations with someone in their life by making them a negative you know negative depiction of a character in in something which you know, I, we all get frustrated. Everybody has interpersonal problems with other people. That's life. That's part of life. But when you have, you know, when, when you have control over what goes into a movie, you know, it's really, you know, you, you shouldn't let your frustrations get you to where you put a nasty parody of them in the movie because they can't really do anything about that you know it's always going to be there and yeah he he doesn't the you know like if this movie was in part shaped by him being frustrated 
with having to like like yeah yeah having to balance work and being with his family being a parent being a husband this really doesn't feel like i i mean honestly this kind of feels like what he yeah maybe maybe this was what he made after he already felt that they i i couldn't quite find that in my research but it feels more like something he he did to kind of say that he's happy with the choices he made more than it feels like the work of someone who's uncertain if things are going to you know go well it it really there's you know you can understand the frustration that bob parr feels but it doesn't you know the, the movie doesn't feel the need to turn like you know his boss is quite a jerk but that you know it it doesn't his his family are legitimately like you know they're they're human beings the there are good good times and bad times but you know and, and i should also say his boss like bob works at a an insurance company and his boss doesn't want for the company to have to pay for people he he just wants people to pay for the free in, insurance without ever actually providing the insurance for them you know so and and you know this is a kind of person who actually exists in the real world and they are jerks and should be taken down in in movies you know it it doesn't feel like a personal attack on someone it feels like just yeah you know i i really appreciate when when movies that I don't know if I would say that it's made for children, but certainly it's fairly accessible to children. When the villain is someone who's actually bad in real life, I would love for like millions of children to watch this movie and grow up thinking, "Wow, I, you know, in insurance company CEOs are, you know, some some of them are real jerks. I'm not saying all of them." But the ones who don't want to pay, you know, and it would maybe motivate them to, like, try to, yeah, do do what they can to, to you know, for, for people, greedy people who just want to take from others to not succeed in life. Which is, again, that, that was also something Renegade P Cut pointed to that the the character who most resembles the the objectivist ideal is bob's boss and the movie unequivocally unequivocally without exception i know how to pronounce the word i just my my tongue is rebelling against the word right now unequivocally the movie is against his character like his character is clearly made out to be like yeah i guess evil honestly evil the the yeah and yeah again you know the the i i i tend not to believe that people in the real world are evil it's just that there are ideas and actions that are evil the the idea of evil people well what what do you do then i guess just just you know find them and lock them up for life no but if if ideas and behaviors are evil ideas and behaviors can be changed now yeah so the the movie opens with this montage of the supers being interviewed you know back when they were still active immediately setting up this contrast between normal and super you know it, it is this thing of the the yeah like the the it, it makes sense that that like yeah something as ordinary and like you know interviews that that happens all the time people with superpowers that's the unusual thing but yeah, you know, realistically, like, if there were people, like, 
when when Bob as Mr. Incredible when he unleashes his full, full strength, he can like there's a there's a part where he's like just working out, you know, building muscle, and he does this by lifting entire train cars. You know, if you knew someone like that in real life, yeah, you try to get them and you try to interview them. You you'd want to you know, that's that's really interesting. You know, that's something that people will pay attention to. You you want an interview, but just seeing like an interview with someone who can do that, it yeah, you know, there 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 are other comic book stories where like the media is involved, but very frequently it is. I I don't know of any animated movie based on you know that had a comic book thing going on that had the the same idea before this movie. And the first real scene is some super action. And yeah, so I'm not going to give away whether the ending is happy or sad, but it fits with what came before. I am extremely happy with how the movie ends. It is an excellent ending. There is no deus ex machina. There's no convenient writing. And the ending titles are quite good. This is, you know, I, I think that might be a thing with animated movies, but again, I don't watch many. But the the first chunk of the, the credits are also, you know, not, not, not really scenes, but like they're, they're visually appealing. There's like, yeah, artwork and, and some animation as the, the names. Yeah. And the movie, you know, the, the tone of the ending fits that the tone of the ending credits fits the tone of the ending itself and yeah no part of this movie ever lost my interest i i can imagine like if you watch this like a ton of times if you don't really get into the the drama and the sort of present day suburban life stuff I could imagine some people might, fa you know, like fast forward through those parts and just watch the scenes of, of action. I can understand that. I I don't see myself doing it. I, it would definitely, the, the action wouldn't be as satisfying to watch without that. So yeah, the superpowers include super strength, super elasticity, invisibility, force fields. These are four fantastic powers. See what I did there? There's also telekinesis and just the, the one, one of the characters has this freezing power. So yeah, some really, really cool stuff. And you can tell, you know, clearly the, there's some there's some fantastic four, there's some X-Men characters used as inspiration that's another thing it doesn't feel like they just took the characters and like didn't pay licensing fees the, these are original characters and the you know for, for the, the fantastic four thing yeah they they didn't just copy to be fair i you know elastic girl's powers are very very similar to Mr. Fantastics. And the... Yeah, the young woman on the team who can turn herself invisible can also do force fields. So... Yeah, there's there are similarities, but it's not... It doesn't feel like a, a ripoff. So, the characters... Craig T. Nelson plays Bob Parr slash Mr. Incredible, Helen's husband possessing superhuman strength, 
And Brad Bird always, according to IMDb Trivia, Brad Bird always wrote the character of Bob, Mr. Incredible, as a Craig T. Nelson type. He flirted with the idea of Harrison Ford voicing Bob, but always had Craig T. Nelson in mind to do the voice for Mr. Incredible. Other than this, the only thing I've seen him in is Coach. I have to be, he, he's perfect for this role. He really, like, yeah. It's, you know, sometimes you can just tell that it was legitimately written for a specific actor. Holly Hunter plays Helen Parr slash Elastigirl, Bob's wife who has the ability to stretch her body like rubber. Holly Hunter, cast as Helen Parr Elastigirl, never voiced an animated character before and saw the role as an exciting opportunity to expand her repertoire. She was also drawn to the film by its unique and unconventional story about family and human dynamics. Bird considered Hunter one of the finest actresses in the world, capable of playing a sensitive character who also has a very sturdy center. And, you know, Helen is very happy with Bob because he's bona fide, and thankfully she stays away from any twerps who ramble on about rocks from space. And, yeah, quoting one of my fellow critics, Elastigirl is empowered like all the women in this, despite the 1960s setting, which could easily restrict her character, which would be very frustrating, very true. And Sarah Vowell plays Violet Parr, the Parr's eldest child, who can become invisible and generate an impact-resistant force shield. Sarah Vowell was offered the role of Violet unexpectedly. Brad Bird wanted to cast Vowell as Violet after hearing her voice on the na National Public Radio Program. This American Life, Bird stated that she was perfect for the part and immediately called her to offer her the role. And according to IMDb Trivia, you know, Brad Bird felt her voice was perfect for Violet, even though she had never acted before. To convince her, Pixar animators animated one of Val's segments from This American Life and sent it to her. That's really cool. And that is, yeah, an, an excellent way to yeah and uh, you know as several critics have pointed out the powers of invisibility and creating barriers between herself and others is a perfect metaphor for a teenage girl and spencer fox plays dashiel dash par the par's second child possessing super speed Spencer Fox was cast as Dash Parr, which was also his feature film debut. Brad Bird wanted to give Dash a realistic out-of-breath voice in certain scenes, so he made Fox run four laps around the Pixar studio until he got tired. I mean, four laps. Yeah, I guess that's not excessive. I don't know. I, I, I kind of hope that they, like, talk to someone about, like, you know, don't make the kid do too much... Yeah, anyway, it worked. Like, in the scenes where he's supposed to sound out of breath, he legitimately, like, he sounds out of breath, but the acting is still on point. And there's critics have pointed out, his super speed is basically an exaggerated version of the boundless energy of a young boy. And the... Eli Fuchile and Maeve Andrews play Jack Jack Parr, the Parr's infant son. And Jason Lee plays Buddy Pine slash Incrediboy, Mr. Incredible's fan. You know, I've, I've always been quite a fan of his. Honestly, I would have to say his role was probably what I was most looking forward to in this. And it did not disappoint. Like, absolutely loved it. And, like, yeah, he was cast because of his performance in Dogma, which is also, that's one of my favorite roles of his. So, yeah, I can 100% understand why the, yeah. And Joaquin Phoenix was considered for the role. And, I yeah, I can see that. I, I... Joaquin Phoenix is one of the best actors, with without a doubt. Of of as you know, as as long as we've been acting, he's one of the best actors. But I do think that Jason Lee fits better than, I, yeah. Anyway, 
Sam Jackson plays Lucius Best slash Frozone, Bob's best friend who can form ice from humidity, not out of thin air. I quite appreciate that, you know, that, that, yeah. Making ice from humidity makes much more sense than just making it out of thin air. And, let's see. And Bird cast Sam Jackson because he stated he wanted the character to have the coolest voice. I see what you did there. And Elizabeth Pena plays Mirage. I didn't expect the character to be as interesting as she was when I when I first like when she's just introduced. She it's, it seems like a fairly straightforward, but there's more in, there there's more to her than you might at first see. It's yeah, very interesting, excellent performance. And Brad Bird himself voices Edna E. Mode, the fashion designer for the Supers. Lily Tomlin was originally considered for the role of Edna Mode, but later turned it down after several failed attempts to cast Edna Mode. Bird took on her voice role himself. It was an extension of the Pixar custom of tapping in-house staff whose voices came across particularly well on Scratch dialogue tracks. There's a lot of movies based on comics, and a lot of comics, where... We don't, like, the, the fact that everyone has a costume that fits their superpowers and kind of the vibe they want to get across. So I really appreciate that in this movie, it's a specific, like, they, they made a character who makes these costumes. And, you know, she's also a legitimately really interesting person. She's a lot of people's favorite character, and it's easy to see why. Her enthusiasm... Her skill, her personality, uh, you know, Jenny Nicholson did a video on the second movie, and, you know, if you know Jenny Nicholson, you know she tends to wear some sort of costume for her videos, or failing that, at least having some sort of prop, like the Infinity Gauntlet. I, I don't think she put on a costume for the for Infinity War and Endgame, but she did have the, the gauntlet. And f yeah, for this, she she I, I think she could probably have pulled off any of the characters that she wanted to, and yeah, and it does also like she it yeah that the the hair looks good on her, and let's see, I think that might be about right. I just want to briefly. Wallace Shawn plays Gilbert Huff, Bob's demeaning boss. He is really, really good. I, I, I don't think I've watched. What's it called again? The Princess. I don't even. I right now I forget what it's called. But you know that's one that people know him from. I, maybe I did watch it when I was younger, and I just don't remember that I did. But you know, I've seen clips. He's hilarious in that, and he's he's so good in this. Like, it's not like he doesn't have a huge amount of screen time, but he's incredibly memorable. He's just he's so obnoxious, and like I said, I mean he's practically evil. He's he's very close to being an evil person. And let's see. I get, right, I also just briefly Brett Parker plays Kari, Jack Jack babysitter. Again, not a huge amount of screen time. I don't want to talk it up too much. I just I think she Brett they did an excellent job. I I, I'm not entirely sure. If I had to guess, Brett sounds like a boy's name. I I don't know. They they did an incredible job. It yeah. And if the you know if if you whether you get this on like DVD or Blu-ray or you watch it on Disney Plus. You know, Disney Plus has the short Jack-Jack attack. I've read that so do DVDs and Blu-rays. Make sure you watch that. Kari appears in that as the babysitter, and it's 
yeah, it's hilarious. They did a really great job on that. And John Ratzenberger shows up. Again, not a huge amount of screen time. I don't think I want to say who his, what character he plays. He's great in it. And that's not, that's, it's not a surprise, you know. It, yeah, he's, he's great. And, yeah, so I already mentioned that the, you know, we, we have multiple different age groups, like, most of the characters are white, but we do have different age groups, you know, both genders. Yeah, the, the, diversity in casting is one thing, but, you know, not, there's not always an attempt to actually understand the unique perspectives of its minority characters, and with this one they do, you know, you really get the sense, no character feels like it's just, you know, someone out of touch trying to guess at or even worse just someone saying yeah let's just do a stereotype people like stereotypes you know you really do feel like the you know it's it's like what i said in my my simpsons review of, of bart simpson you know clearly when writing dash you know brad bird must really remember what or, or maybe i guess if he has a son himself maybe that's where but he clearly understands how this like 10 year old boy like what a typical 10 year old boy thinks like and acts like and you know violet the the yeah teenage girl you know, there's there's this boy that she has a crush on, but she also, like, she's nervous around him. And, you know, Helen really wants to make sure that, like, Helen is very focused on the family and being the best mother that she can be. And, you know, she feels that Bob doesn't, you know, appreciate that his family is amazing. You know, he he's missing the glory days. And, you know, yeah, she rightly points out that his family is the, the you know, yeah, they, they used to do that, but now they have a family. They have to be responsible in, in a different way. They were also responsible, you know, when they were super, they were being responsible in how in in avoiding too much uh, collateral damage and and protecting people and such. But yeah, it doesn't feel she she never comes across as like being obnoxious or nagging or something, and the the children don't the yeah children child and teenager characters in the movie don't come across as just like sometimes you can tell when when characters like that are being written by people who just don't really like children and teenagers and they're just like really again like nasty stereotypes just someone taking out their frustration and yeah that's never the case here it never felt like Nobody ever acts just like, like, you know, Dash can be like impatient and brash and such. Part of it is that, you know, he has super speed, but they won't let him participate in sports, you know. So like the thing he's most good at, they tell him he has to hide. So, you know, of course he's going to be. Yeah. And it. You know, and, and sometimes he teases his sister, and, like, Violet can be, like, there, there are, like, since she's the oldest of the children, you know, if, if there is, like, a sudden situation where the children are by themselves, you know, Helen tells her, you're in charge until I get back. And, you know... 
you can you can tell that there is like she does want to make sure that nothing happens to, you know as as frustrating and annoying as dash can be sometimes she doesn't want anything to happen to him you know there there are yeah some some stories where the the yeah where where it's handled by people who don't like kids or teenagers and such now I am gonna quote some fellow critics the movie is mostly about Bob I wish it focused more on the other family members I have to say that was that's essentially my only real criticism of this movie I you know it is called The Incredibles but it's mostly about it, it you know they almost might as well have called it Mr. Incredible it's it focuses so much on him and this is something that I hear they try to address with the, the sequel not everybody thinks it worked out but yeah it, it's not bad the movie is amazing I think it would have been good if a little bit more time had been spent on the rest of the family especially the the yeah dash and violet and helen doesn't get a lot to do that isn't in relation to bob returning to critic quotes the yeah the three different kids have uh, yeah they need different things from the mother she tries to give all of them what they need you know she's flexible as mothers have to be you can see yourself in the the characters movie starts let's see everybody in this is human everybody makes mistakes that people make in real life every character that appears will make you laugh or intrigue you in some way i have to admit that i was laughing myself throughout the entire movie especially with the character of edna mode who almost steals the movie and let's see. so yes some stuff from wikipedia the film also explored bird's dislike for the tendency of the children's comics and saturday morning cartoons of his youth to portray villains as unrealistic ineffectual and non-threatening in the film dash and violet have to deal with villains who are perfectly willing to use deadly force against children in 2005 bird was not surprised that comparisons arose due to superheroes being the most well-trod turf on the planet. <laughs> yeah, in 2005, that was definitely this, you know, not, not today, when, I want to say there's at least seven different comic book movies in this year, in the, in 2022. And... The dad is always expected in the family to be strong, so I made him strong. The moms are always pulled in a million different directions, so I made her stretch like taffy. Teenagers, particularly teenage girls, are insecure and defensive, so I made her turn invisible, turn on shields. And 10-year-old boys are hyperactive energy balls. Babies are unrealized potential. Bird came to Pixar with a lineup of the story's family members worked out. A mom and dad, both suffering through the dad's midlife crisis. Shy teenage girl, a cocky 10-year-old boy, and a baby. Bird had passed their power, based their powers on family archetypes during production. Hayao Miyazaki of Studio Ghibli visited Pixar and saw the film's story reels. When Bird asked if the reels made any sense or if they were just American nonsense, Miyazaki replied for an interpreter, I think it's a very adventurous thing you're trying to do in an American film. So yeah, the the dialogue is really great. Like, you know, the the characters talk the way people do in real life. There's no white noise. Even the like, there's a little bit of dialogue where we're basically supposed to think, "Wow, this character just drones on and on," but it's still interesting if you actually pay attention to them. And it does a good job of delivering exposition, which also, like, the movie 
the movie is good at conveying exposition visually. Like, if... Uh, is that... Yeah, yeah. You know, we learn a lot about the world that the movie takes place in via visuals instead of just... Because that, that is, you know, that can be a problem with both comic books and their adaptations. And again, I say that as someone who loves comic books. But in a comic book, you know, you only have so many pages. If you have to get a lot of information across, maybe you have a character explain a bunch of stuff. And, you know, some movies do a really good job of making that visual you know, trimming away anything that isn't absolutely necessary, but some don't. This one, I was very impressed. And, yeah, there's some really, there's some great quotable, memorable lines. And, you know, the, the IMDb quote section has 127 entries, and all of them are, are good. And, you know, there are a number of quotes from this that are, like, memes and used in memes and such. And you, you can really understand why. And that brings us to the cinematography. The cinematography keeps it easy to follow when something suddenly happens, like in action scenes. The movie doesn't have hyperactive cinematography when it should be more calm. There are no unnecessary shots. The, the cinematography was handled by Andrew Jimenez, who was an animatic artist on Ratatouille, a digital artist on Monsters, Inc. Patrick Lynn, who was a layout artist on Ratatouille and A Bug's Life, and lead layout artist on Monsters, Inc., and Janet LaCroix, who was a lighting technician on A Bug's Life and directing light, lighting artist on Monsters, Inc. And, yeah, various credit, critics have pointed out the movie has excellent cinematography, the lighting, the shot composition. This has some of the most visually arresting action that I've ever seen. And, and that is, in general, like... Brad Bird is really good at, at that kind of thing. That is also something you see in his Mission Impossible movie. You know, easily one of the best, visually speaking, of, of that entire series. And just, yeah. I, I will talk more about the action, but I, it has its own section. I will get to it. Yeah, so the editing was handled by Stephen Schaefer, who also edited Jack-Jack Attack. And the editing, like the cinematography, keeps it easy to follow fast-moving scenes, like action scenes. And it's much more calm when that's called for. There are no scenes that should be cut, moved in the overall structure, trimmed down, or increased in length. You know, editing is, is difficult. It is a massive challenge, especially on something like this, because this movie does have a lot. Like, hypothetically, if you were trying to just explain to someone the the important things to know about this movie it would take a while and it would be a lot of explaining you know the, it's not something you can explain in, in just in in absolutely no time or just by saying oh it's just like this other thing and managing to convey all this information so much of it done visually and managing to spread out the information over the course of the film you know that's another thing like if you have if you have a movie with a lot of information to get across some movies will make the mistake of having a lot of it in one spot and that just becomes a real chore to sit through as we get a lot of explanation or even a lot of visual storytelling you know, if like if you took all of the visual storytelling of this movie and tried to cram it into a very short span of, uh, span of time or put it in one specific spot in the movie rather than little bits across uh, the the entire thing, yeah, it would it would be exhausting. But because they managed to spread it out and there are there's there's breathing room, it never becomes exhausting. 
the animation holds up really well. The the I've I've seen some people criticize I I don't know. I th I thought it they they did incredible. And one critic said the characters look like 3D cartoon characters, not people. And that is the right way to do this kind of thing. And I would have to agree. Like, the, you know, you look at the characters in this, not a single one of them look exactly the way a, a person. Like, there, there's basically exaggerations of, like, you know, the, the, like, Bob is this, you know, strong man, so it, you know, he has a strong chin, but it's like massive, you know, it's, it's cartoonishly big, it's bigger than, you know, yeah, and, and the, the, let's see, what would be another good example, Edna Mode also, like, really, like, a, yeah, a cartoon character with the, with the design, and, guess that might be more or less it for that. Yeah, so going to some Wikipedia quotes. Upon Pixar's acceptance of the project, Brad Bird was asked to bring in his own team for the production. He brought up a core group of people he worked with on the Iron Giant. Because of this, many 2D artists had to make the shift to 3D, including Bird himself. Bird found working with CGI wonderfully malleable in a way that traditional animation is not, calling the camera's ability to easily switch angles in a given scene marvelously ad adaptable he found yeah he made incredible work holy crap his camera is yeah he found working in computer animation difficult in a different way than working traditionally finding the software sophisticated and not particularly friendly i've done very little animation myself but that is that is my personal experience as well Bird wrote the script without knowing the limitations or concerns that went hand in hand with the medium of computer. And don't worry, I'm not going to be showing you my animation. I, what could you possibly have done? To I'm, I'm, I'm not. You know, some some cruel. No, no, no. Don't worry. I'm not even sure I still have copies of it actually, because it was not good. As a result, this was to be the most complex film yet for Pixar. The film's characters were designed by Tony Fuchile and Teddy Newton, whom Bird had brought with him from Warner Brothers. Like most computer animated films, The Incredibles had a year-long period of building the film from the inside out, modeling the exterior and understanding controls that would work the face and the body, the articulation of the character, before animation could even begin. Bird and Fuchili tried to emphasize the graphic quality of good 2D animation and the Pixar team would only work primarily in CGI. Bird attempted to incorporate teaching from Disney's Nine Old Men that the crew at Pixar had never really emphasized. The technical crew members, the film's human characters, posed a difficult set of challenges. Bird's story was filled with elements that were difficult to animate with CGI back then. Humans are widely considered to be the most difficult things to execute in animation. Pixar's animators filmed themselves walking to better grasp hum proper human motion. Creating an all-human cast required creating new technology to animate detailed human anatomy, clothing, and realistic skin and hair. Although the technical team had some experience with hair and cloth in Monsters, Inc., the amount of hair and cloth required for The Incredibles had never been done by Pixar up until this point. Moreover, Bird would tolerate no compromises for the sake of technical simplicity. With the technical team on Monsters, Inc., had persuaded director Pete Docter to accept pigtails on Boo to make her hair easier to animate, the character Violet had to have long hair that obscured her face. In fact, this was integral to her character. Violet's long hair, which was extremely difficult to animate, was only successfully animated toward the end of production. There's actually, there are some really funny bloopers of the... I, I forget, was it called an animation reel or something, but on on Disney Plus, of just the hair going completely nuts, because, you know, we take for granted, you know, it's, it's hair, it just does, but no, in, in, you know, a computer, you have to tell the computer how it's going to move, and, you know, the, the, dif the different physics, the different situations, because it's not like she's just a character who stands still, this movie, you know, she moves fast, which makes it wave, and, like, you know, it's, there's a, there's a point where her hair is wet, which, like, yeah, if, if you want to make a, a grown man cry, find 
someone who animates and tell them to animate like something that's wet especially hair it's yeah uh, it's it's not easy and 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 especially in in motion also yeah in addition, animators had to adapt to having both underwater and blowing through the yeah, hair underwater and blowing through the wind. Disney was initially reluctant to make the film because of these issues, thinking that a live action film would be preferable, but Lasseter denied this. Incredibles was everything that computer generation generated animation had trouble doing. Human characters, hair, water, fire, a massive number of sets. The creative heads were excited about the idea of the film, but once I showed story reels of exactly what I wanted, the technical teams turned white. They took one look and thought, this will take 10 years and cost 500 million. How are we possibly going to do this? So I said, give us the black sheep. I want artists who are frustrated. I want the ones who have another way of doing things that nobody's listening to. Give us all the guys that are probably headed out the door. A lot of them were malcontents because they saw different ways of doing things, but there was little opportunity to try them since the established way was working very, very well. We gave the black sheep a chance to prove the theories, and we changed the number, the way a number of things are done here. For less movie per minute than was spent on the previous film, Finding Nemo, we did a movie that had three times the number of sets and had everything that was hard to do. All this because the heads of Pixar gave us leave to try crazy ideas. Not only did The Incredibles cope with the difficulty of animating CGI humans, but also many other complications. The story was bigger than any prior story at the studio, was longer in running time, and had four times the number of locations. Holy crap. Supervising technical director Rick Sayer noted that the hardest thing about the film was that there was no hardest thing, alluding to the amount of new technical challenges. Fire, water, air, smoke, steam, and explosions were all additional to the new difficulty of working with humans. The film's organizational structure could not be mapped out like previous Pixar features, and it became a running joke to the team. Sayer said the team adopted Alpha Omega, where one team was concerned with building modeling shading and layout, while another dealt with final camera, lighting, and effects. Another team, dubbed the character team, digitally sculpted, rigged, and shaded all of the characters, and a simulation team was responsible for developing simulation technology for hair and clothing. There were at least 781 visual effects shots in the film, and they were quite often visual gags, such as the window shattering when Bob angrily shuts the car door. I, sh I should just briefly note, I talked about how the the character designs are cartoonish, and and yet there's there are these quotes about how difficult it is to animate human beings. The character designs are car cartoonish, but when you look at the actual movement, and you know one one thing that's especially like if you look at the eyes, that's one of the most difficult things, you know. And, and if you don't animate eyes just right, they look chilling. They, it's like a horror movie, you know. It, it, think about how many horror movies are about a doll with creepy eyes. That's what you can end up with. Uh, you know, if, if just the eyes are wrong, it can be, like, really scary. Back to the quote. Additionally, the effects team improved their modeling of clouds using volumetric rendering for the first time. The skin of the characters gained a new level of realism from a technology to produce known as subsurface scattering. The challenges did not stop with modeling humans. Bird decided that there would be goo. Technical directors who anticipated spending two months or even longer to work on the goo effect, stealing precious hours from production that had already entered its final and most critical stages, petitioned the film's producer, John Walker, for help. Bird, who had himself brought Walker over from Warner Brothers to work on the product, was at first immovable, but after arguing with Walker in several invective-laced meetings over the course of two months, Bird finally conceded. Bird also insisted that the storyboards define the blocking of the character's motions, lighting, and character mo camera movements, which had previously been left to other departments rather than storyboarded. Bird admitted that he had the knees of the studio trembling under the weight of The Incredibles, but called the film a testament to the talent of the animators at Pixar, who were admiring the challenges the film provoked. He recalled, Basically, I came into a wonderful studio, frightened a lot of people with how many presents I wanted for Christmas, and then got almost everything I asked for. And, right, 
according to IMDb Trivia, writer and director Brad Bird originally conceived this as a conventional cell animated film when he pitched it. The cell animated sequences seen in the end credits are a representation of his original concept. In order to get the huge crowds and extra characters the film needed, animators created a standard band which could be modified to play different roles. For instance, Dash's teacher, the school principal, and the underminer are all the same character, though heavily modified. Yeah, I, I will have to admit, I noticed that some of the cop characters look very similar. I mean, I guess it's possible that, like, it's an Irish family and all the brothers enlisted, I don't know, en enlisted? Became cops, whatever. And that brings us to the action. So... Yeah, quoting fellow critic here, Bird and company create action sequences that are as exciting, if not more so, than in the action films that have been released this year. In fact, some of the scenes in the climax, for my money, could rival a couple of those in Spider-Man 2. Yeah, it's, it's, it's incredible. And, and that's another thing, you know, you want visual action, you go to Sam Raimi. It really is, like, the... the there, there will be scenes where something is moving fast, like a, a, a jet or something being flown by, like, yeah, the various flying things. And the camera will move with them so we can really feel how fast it is and, and putting us right there, like... There are times where it feels like we are sitting on this plane and, and feeling, you know, it's, it's wild. You know, if, if you, if you know someone who says that no action movie has, like, like that action movies are by definition bad or something, you know, show them the action scenes in this. And... That brings us to yeah so I'm not gonna go too much into detail about the villains I'm just gonna say they're uh, tremendously memorable you know some some people have expressed that this is some of like the villain of this movie is one of their favorite villains and yeah same absolutely incredible villain and yeah so the music was handled by Michael G I should have looked up how to pronounce this Kino yeah Michael Giacchino not Giacchino and yeah you know he he did music for Spider-Man No Way Home Into the Spider-Verse Civil War, Winter Soldier, Wolf of Wall Street. Oh, wait, no, that's just the Paramount Pictures theme. Anyway, right, he did also work on Ghost Pro, the Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol, the. Pretty sure, yeah, yeah that's the one that Redbird directed. And. Let's see, yeah, he, he did music and lyrics for. Song Ratatouille, and he did some great music for Alias and Lost. And yeah, the the soundtrack legitimately is just fantastic. You know, it's it's worth owning and listening to. There's a lot of it on here on YouTube, and just yeah, it's you you can listen to it without watching the movie. I I listened through all of it before watching it, and just yeah, the music fits absolutely perfectly it's not afraid to have this classical superhero style and to be epic and yeah quoting some fellow critics there's there's some very sean connery george lazenby james bond muse sounding music which fits the whole spy theme i already mentioned the technological threats very, yeah, the, the, uh, what's the word? There's a lot of gadgets and, and such in this. 
And according to Wikipedia, The Incredibles is the first Pixar film to be scored by Michael Giacchino. Brad Bird was looking for a specific sound, as inspired by the film's retro-futuristic design and future as seen from the 1960s. John Barry was the first choice to do the film score, with the trailer of the film given a re-recording of Barry's theme on how her on Her Majesty's Secret Service. However, Barry did not wish to duplicate the sound of some of his earlier soundtracks. The assignment was instead given to Giacchino. Giacchino noted that recording in the 1960s was largely different from modern day recording. And Dan Wallen, the recording engineer, said that Bird wanted an old feel. And as such, the score was recorded on analog tapes. Wallen noted that brass instruments, which are at the forefront of the film score, sounded better on analog than, rather than digital. Wallen came from an era in which music was recorded, according to Giacchino, the right way, which consists of everyone in the same room playing against each other and feeding off each other's energy. Many of Giacchino's future soundtracks followed suit with the style of mixing, which has divided critics who feel that the recordings sometimes don't sound natural. Tim Semenik was the conductor slash orchestrator for this score's recording. The film's orchestral score was released on November 2, 2004 by Walt Disney Records, three days before the film opened in theaters. It won numerous awards for Best Score, including Los Angeles Film Critics Association Award, BMI Film and TV Award, ASCAP Film and Television Music Award, Annie Award, Las Vegas Film Critics Society Award, and Online Film Critics Society Award, and was nominated for Grammy Award for Best Score Soundtrack for Visual Media, Satellite Award, and Broadcast Film Critics Association Award. And, yeah, so according to MB Trivia, to record the Henry Mancini and John Barry-inspired jazz orchestra, orchestra score, composer Michael Giacchino eschewed standard multi-track recording and returned to the analog recording methods used for jazz orchestra recordings in the 1960s. We were just like, forget that. Let's throw everyone in the room. Let's pretend we only have three microphones, and let's get it right. Let's just do it. And the sound design is also great. The, yeah, the various gadgets sound exactly right. And the the comedy is, is really great. You know, we have physical comedy. We have verbal and wit. We have some sitcom stuff sitcom type stuff not exactly sitcom and yeah quoting the fellow critic it's funny it's not so funny that you're constantly laughing out loud but there are more than enough good jokes in the movie to keep you entertained and it's full of good observations about superhero movies note all the ridiculous superhero and villain names and references to other movies it's also a brilliant james bond spoof homage containing all the gadgets secret island bases and crazy schemes that made early bond movies so much fun and yeah so pacing if you don't watch a lot of animated movies keep in mind a lot of them move much faster than live action movies and this one as well and let's see right so Yeah, some some said that it's a little longer than they thought it should be. But yeah, quoting a fellow critic here, I often find the movies aren't paced well. They either have too long or too short an introduction to the characters, or the events that lead up to the pivotal point of the movie are unbalanced against the climax, all sorts of combinations. Not here. This movie is perfect and well balanced. The story takes you along just when you are ready, and there are no points where I wish we could move on or something could happen quicker. My only frustration were the kids, and this was only because they were behaving exactly as real kids would. The movie is an hour and 57 minutes long without end credits. With end credits, without them, they, it is an hour and 47 and a half minutes. And, yeah, so, this is the part, 
Right, yeah. First, so I would definitely say that the best element of this movie is the family dynamic. It's, it's a tie between the family dynamics and how it has something for every age. Like, the, you know, the kids watching this aren't going to get the, the, the relate as much to Bob's midlife crisis as a lot of the adults watching will. And... Yeah, also the action scenes weren't some, some of the best. So the worst aspect... Some people do think that it's objectivist, and I think a strong case could be made that the movie should have been more careful not to come across as if it does, because, you know, I, I, I said that I don't agree with the reading that, that, it, that it is objectivist. I definitely understand that reading. I, I get what it is people find in this movie that makes them think objectivist, and yeah. And let's see, I guess Yeah, so the the thing I was most looking forward to about it was Jason Lee and the superheroics and in both they exceeded my expectations. The trailers give away a little bit too much but also give you a good idea of what the movie is like. If you like the trailer, you're more likely to like the movie than if not. The cover and poster don't give too much away. And they do strike the right tone. And that brings us to On Rotten Tomatoes. This has a 97% on the tomato meter based on 247 reviews, and 75% audience score, based on over a quarter million ratings. So of the 247 critics counted, only 7 of them are rotten. And for the 75% audience score, the average rating was 3.4 out of 5. Right, and the critic average rating was 8.40 out of 10, so yeah. The movie is certified fresh. On Metacritic, it has 90 out of 100, and the user score 8.8 .8 out of 10. And when I checked, the last user reviews were from December 30th, 2021, and there are 41 Metacritic ratings and 138 user reviews. So on IMDb, the rating is... Eight and let's see. Right, and yeah, just briefly, I wanted to get into the movie has 1,006 IMDb user reviews, which, considering how many years ago it came out, like that's pretty significant. That's yeah, this is a movie that a lot of people went back to and wrote a review for because it means so much to them. Of the top 100 IMDb user reviews, 6 gave it 1 out of 10, 2 gave it 2 out of 10, 1 gave it 3 out of 10, 0 gave it 4 out of 10, 2 gave it 5 out of 10, 3 gave it 6 out of 10, 4 gave it 7 out of 10, 10 gave it 8 out of 10, 27 gave it 9 out of 10, and 46 gave it 10 out of 10. Perfect score. So this is a... Moth? This is a very posi positively received movie. And 239 links in the IMDb external review section. And 137 of them were not dead links and were in English. And yeah, so 694,808 IMDb users voted on this. And so yeah, 32.7% gave it an 8, 20.3% uh, gave it a 9, 18.6% gave it a 7, 17.1% gave it a, a 10. 
yeah, this is this is a very popular movie, as you can tell. And that brings us. Yeah. The so the yeah on on Disney Plus the the movie has the following extras about thirty two minutes of deleted scenes which you know considering that it's an animated movie that means we watch storyboards some of them animated and animatics still frames and such as Brad Bird and to a lesser extent store supervisor Mark Andrews describe what the final scene would have ended up as. Disney Plus also has the five and a half minute short Jack Jack attack. And yeah, the, the, the deleted scenes are well worth watching and Jack Jack attack is incredibly funny. I am aware that in addition to Jack Jack attack, the short Mr. Incredible and Pals was commissioned for this and is featured on the home release. It is not currently on Disney Plus, so I can't comment on it. But yeah, the, it's it's well worth watching the the extras. And yeah, right now you can watch the movie on Disney Plus, Vudu, Google Play, Amazon Instant Video, and iTunes. So yeah, the yeah. I give this eight incredible family members as sources of drama and strength out of ten. I could watch this movie again immediately. Like, I, I probably won't. But, like, if... Yeah. I, I, I would be happy to. I would enjoy it tremendously, even though I just got done watching it already. And that brings us to the thoughts section. So, the rest of this video is not a review. It's a series of, well, thoughts. Some is analysis, some is MSB riff tracks and other jokes. Time codes for all the sections in the description box. The section right of this are thoughts I had while watching, chronological order, for them as a running commentary like tweeting or like, and the section after that is thoughts I had before watching. Now, I... I'm going to dive right into notes taken while watching. Genuinely tense and exciting as Mr. Incredible has to try to get Squeaker the cat out of the tree. But the robbers are also approaching rapidly. And it is very sweet that he does stop this hot pursuit to help an old woman get a cat out of a tree. You know, originally he was just, like, he was trying to get into, uh, what's it called? Like, he wanted to get ahead of the robbers so that he could stop them. But then when he gets to there, you know, this, this old woman, and instead of saying, I promise you I will help with your cat, but there are robbers. No, he's like, yeah, okay, okay, I could do that. And, like... Instead of like climbing up the tree, which would be, you know, work smart, not hard, he just uproots this thing and starts like, like, like when you're trying to get, like the, the, if, if the, if, if you've got like a, a spoon of, of some kind, of like, like peanut butter or something that's, you know, just shaking to until it eventually comes up, you know, just, and, and, yeah. And then just as soon as Squeaker is is off, you know, he, he flips the, the tree around so the, the robbers drive directly into it. Great flirting between Mr. Incredible and Elastigirl. I like that the mugger chimes in. The lady did get me first. Nobody stop! There's a bomb on your cape! Yeah, okay, I know I did that reference. Two weeks in a row. I can't help if the movies keep setting me up for it. Obviously, obviously, if you're going to sue a super, it has to be in superior court. And we go to 15 years later. Bob is incredibly depressed. Helen is happy, but for a different reason than she used to be. 
The last thing you need is temptation. She's tough but fair. He can resist everything except temptation. And Bob is visually constrained in tiny spaces, first in his tiny cubicle, now in his tiny car. The only one normal is Jack-Jack, and he's not even toilet trained. Lucky. I mean, about being normal. I can't. It's evaporating too fast. Am I supposed to know what that means? Not really. I just need you to know how much trouble it is. Mr. Hoff has four pencils on the paper on the desk. Bob accidentally bumps into the table, makes one of them slide slightly, and Mr. Hoff immediately puts it back in place. Great characterization. You really get a strong sense of who he is from that. Like, wow, this guy's a perfection. And, and just everything has to be within the, like, yeah. You believe that you are special, that somehow the rules do not apply to you. It is supremely satisfying when Bob throws Mr. Huff through multiple walls after he's such a jerk. Like, the, the you know, he literally, Bob witnesses a mugging, and he tells it, there's someone over there being mugged. You know, and Mr. Huff doesn't care. And, and you know, Bob looks back. He, you know, what was it he said? Um, I could, uh, ah, crap, I, I forget. But, you know, he, you know, he, he expresses frustration and not getting to save the guy. And not, yeah, not saving the guy because of Huff. And, and Huff is like, good. At least we don't have to pay him, you know, from, from, you know what we have was he says i hope he's not insured with us or yeah some some yeah and you know when bob is you know he gets the 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 message and then like the camera turns and pans and we see the wall of his previous victories not only does bob lie about getting fired he also claims that the job is why he'll be gone. Really cool pod thing that Bob gets down to the island on. You know, first it gets shot out of a plane, and then there's like rotor things to make sure it gets to the right spot and lands, not crashes. Holy crap, the Omnidroid puts up a good fight. Even the lava doesn't get, you know, and he defeated it by using the oldest tactic, you know, sometimes. You have to go with with the classics. Stop the stop hitting yourself. I think the person to popularize it was actually Sun Tzu. And after the mission, Bob is a lot happier. Takes more time to parent the kids, all three of them, and gets in shape using, among other things, train cars. I really like that we see that Helen is more attracted to Bob when he's confident and happy and a good father. You know, so so many of these movies you know, are just like, ugh, oh, women, the moment that you get married, they're just annoying. And so, no, you know, if you're a good parent and a good husband, you know, yeah, she will appreciate that. I mean, Edna's no capes rule does make sense. She brought receipts. You're the best of the best, of the few of the proud. Yes, darling, I know. We should all have her confidence. And Bob's arrival at the island is, again, incredibly cool. I love the waterfall that opens up. Or I guess rather it's that something is pushed out past it and then retracts through something like that. Anyway. And Bob tries to get through the lava by pushing one of the giant stone heads, but then it opens, so he has to quickly and awkwardly put it back down and hide from Mirage. And the scene of Mr. Incredible being taken down by those black, ru black rubbery ball things that are fired on him, really, like, legitimately dramatic. Holy crap, the plane scene is tense. 
I really appreciate that at first Helen wants Violet to, you know, use the, 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 the barriers, you know, she has enough faith in her, but ultimately she does realize Violet doesn't have enough faith in herself to do it yet. We're dead, we're dead, we survived, but we're dead. <laughs> yeah, that's that's very accurate to, to a ten year old boy. Oh, you'll get over it. I seem to remember you prefer to work alone. Holy crap, he turns sadistic. I mean it's one thing that to kill the but then yeah. Really cruel. And and Helen gives both kids masks, and Dash puts on his immediately. He's excited at the prospect, but Violet, you know, she doesn't put hers on immediately. And then, you know, Helen talks to her and says, You, you can do this. And Elastigirl using the cable car, hugging. To, to get to the base is quite clever and some great tension as she sneaks around. And then once she's stuck in the first one, then two, and finally three doors, we get some really great humor in addition to the tension. And that's a great, like, when you are when you have a character who's that elastic, you know, you, you kind of, like, how do you, how do you make the like it, it kind of takes away some of that power you know and not not in a frustrating way in a in a way that we didn't expect you know and the ticking clock of the omnidroid approaching Munisburg is legitimately tense and dash can run on water and not only when it's frozen so sweet when the two siblings save the other and really epic when all four of them are reunited using their powers at the same time dash runs for dust for for cover violet blocks bullets and just the smile on her face when she realizes oh yeah i can block bullets and the droid has arrived we see why we, we see it fighting the military i always appreciate when we get an explanation for why it's necessary for the heroes to get into action, why it isn't just military. And Mirage helps the family get into the rocket. And Syndrome made the AI on the droid too good. I would say he should watch the Terminator, but if this is set in the 60s, that movie hasn't come out yet. Very emotional moment when Bob admits he's terrified of losing Helen. A significant chunk of the climax is made up of the supers getting the remote control. I have never been so excited about a game of Keep Away. Okay, once. In a movie that, if I even say the title here, I'm kind of spoiling. I guess if I just say it's an Avengers movie, you can maybe figure out which I'm talking about without spoiling. Yeah. Actually, yes. I so it's an Avengers movie and I'm briefly going to spoil which one it is Avengers Endgame with the the gauntlet itself no more spoilers for Avengers it's very funny seeing them encourage Dash but also make sure he doesn't overdo it during the race and the ending has all of them get ready to stop the Underminer. Very cool. So that brings us to... The next section. Entitled... Notes taken before watching. So yeah, I am very much looking forward to watching the sequel. And Oops. 
Yeah. So some people have interpreted the movie to be about that if you do not have superpowers, which obviously no one does in real life, you don't matter. You are nothing. I really don't think that's the idea. I think we're supposed to take from it that everybody can be super in how good you take care of your family, how good of a parent, son, daughter you are to your loved ones. Them having superpowers and ending up using the superpowers, despite all the bad press they got earlier, I really don't think we're supposed to take that so literally. I think it's just about be yourself. Do the thing that you really feel like as long as it actually helps people and your family should support you in this. It's not wrong to be different and it will only lead to frustration in the long term to pretend like you're just like everybody else. And yeah, you know, without exaggeration, this is one of the best and most important messages that a movie could have. Be yourself. Don't try to just be, yeah. An extremely high number of people experience anxiety and frustration because they can't accept themselves. And obviously, it is extremely important to use empathy when you form your identity. It is not okay to hurt others, and that's what Syndrome does. He, you know, he is living the, the person he, like, he, yeah, he's, he's living out the, the thing that he most wants to, but he's hurting people. At the start of the movie, the problem is that he can't accept limitations. He's not careful enough. And, you know, yeah, the, ultimately he ends up using violence against the authority figure who tried to make sure that he would have these more sensible limitations, to be more careful. You know, that is, the if, if someone tells you that you have to it, that that something you're doing, you have to be more, that you have to do it differently, that the way you're doing it isn't good or isn't good enough, so, you know, stuff like that. You know, if they're right, then the mature thing to do is accept that and try to get better at it. The immature thing to do is to turn around and say, well, fine, if, you know, if you don't think I'm doing a, a good enough job at it, I guess I'll just do it in in a way that hurts people. You know, he's, he tells he tells Bob and us that he's been selling these things to military. You know, so it's gotten a lot of people killed just because he couldn't accept. You know, like he has the you know one of the things of these rocket boots. Like, imagine if he sold that to, like, let's see, uh, if, yeah, I, some something like a firefighter, like, let's, ah, uh, let's see. Yeah, if, if he didn't, like, clearly he cares about the money it's making him, and he has the, like, he wants to be spiteful towards Mr. Incredible. If he legitimately, w I, I guess there's a chance that, at the start of the movie, before we meet him, that he does legitimately want to do good. But certainly after we last see him as the, the child, Buddy, you know, after that he starts doing doing evil. And if he if he still wanted to do good, he could have sold the, the rocket boots to firefight to, to like the government that could then make them for firefighters to rescue people out of tall burning buildings you know it at the end of the movie he's staging a a dangerous threat that he can then stop instead of just doing something good you know he he's so obsessed with like he wants the attention but he doesn't want to actually have to like the the he doesn't want to be responsible And also, you know, the the characters in this movie who say that 
if everyone is special, that means no one is, are the villain and the tenderold boy. You know, they're wrong. That's part of the point of the movie. If you think that everyone being special means that no one is, then you are childish and or evil. That's, I, I think that's what the movie is saying. Like Ayn Rand and the conservatives who believe her ideas, libertarians and such. One of the messages of the movie is that special people have to be responsible. That's why Buddy is evil. He's special, but irresponsible. If everyone is special, that means everyone has to be responsible because everyone can affect the world with their actions. And the movie, you know, the movie is pro-altruism. And yeah, Bob is having a midlife crisis because he can't be himself. The movie calls that being special. And right, also, as far as I can tell, the idea that the superheroes have to retire, you know, it's not so much saying that, you know, the the great people are persecuted, like Ayn Rand believed. The idea is that the you know it's 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 a point about how money and like a profit motive can destroy positive things obviously it's absurd to say that it's better for bad things to happen than for the people who mostly prevent bad things from happening sometimes making mistakes that are small compared to how bad it can go if they didn't stop it You know, I, I think there's an argument, it's, it's possible that when the movie has all these regular people to frivolous lawsuits against supers, and it means the supers have to retire, it might be criticism of holding police accountable. And, you know, an argument against the it being that is that it... You know, it, it was way less... Like, if the movie came out today, it would be perceived that way. But in 2004, people weren't talking about that so much back then. You know, there was way less camera footage because people didn't have a camera in their phone yet. You know, it's possible that Brad Bird is privileged enough to not have had very bad experiences with police. And, you know, I, I did find an article that argued that the second movie is saying that, uh, um, let's see, yeah, the, the second movie is about, is, is using supers as a stand-in for cops. And, let's see. Yeah, so I'm going to very briefly go over some of what Thought Slime said in his video, All Cops Are Bad. The problem isn't with the individual cops, it's policing as an institution. Abolish the police and replace them with something more egalitarian. Currently, the police are very resistant to having their behavior scrutinized. Their actions make it clear that they want to get away with extrajudicial violence. The police protect the rich, not the poor. The system isn't broken. It is made to keep the powerful in control. The police should be abolished and replaced by voluntary, vo a voluntary community self-defense. And, yeah, Thought Slime and Non-Compete both explain this in detail. We should focus not on punishment, but on restitution and rehabilitation. We should prevent crimes instead of punishing them. And yeah, the the there's a I, I loved when Honey said, "I am your wife. I am the greatest good you're ever gonna get." I you know love seeing someone demanded to be treated, you know, well being treated as well as they deserve. Syndrome has an awesome layer. He's so rich, he has a lava fault so loud it keeps him up nights. Now, there are a lot of stories for children and young men where the mother, or the girlfriend, the, the female character who has to be responsible is boring and exists just to prevent other characters from having fun. So I really appreciate that this movie does not do that. 
and the the babysitter Kari, like there are a lot of movies where the teenage babysitter is depicted as being really responsible, not really taking seriously the task or the responsibility. So I really appreciate that this movie, the babysitter, legitimately does seem to want to do a good job. And if you watch Jack Jack Attack, like it's what so many people would have just run away from the house screaming, but she keeps she keeps adapting to all the abilities he's showing, and yeah. And yeah, the island at the end is called Nomanisan or No Man or you know it is it is saying that No Man is an island. Because one of the themes of the movie is that when things go right as opposed to when things go wrong, the people you are with make you a better person. That's what happens for Bob, and it's what doesn't happen for Buddy. There's a deleted scene in which the family meets their neighbors. One of the female neighbors says that raising a family is nothing. Helen challenges her. Do you have any idea how much suffering would fall would fail to take root if more people were good parents? Which is an excellent line. And they even have to flee the party because it looks like Bob accidentally, like he's he's got the, like he's chopping sausages for for grilling. And like the he he accidentally hits his hand. Since he's invulnerable, it just broke the knife. So he throws it away, gets some ketchup on his hand, and you know, Helen claims he has to go to the hospital. And it's it's a really great like there's this like at at one point, you know, he's like he yeah, he hears like a woman screaming because she saw it. Before he realized, he doesn't even feel the pain from it. And then he starts going like, ah, ah. And like, he has to get Helen's attention because both of them have to leave the party. And so he, like, he's he's looking at her and like nodding from over here. Ah, ah. It's, it's just, it's it's really funny. It's well worth watching. Anyway, then when they go to sleep, Syndrome shows up as a burglar. Bob is not at all scared to find have a burglar just a mild nuisance until he realizes that it's a super and all three of them, including Baby Violet, who can all three are invisible, feed him together. Then the house blows up because he accidentally cut the gas pipe. They have an open fireplace. Not sure why they had the thing lit at night, but whatever. And at the very tail end of the movie, the Underminer shows up and declares war on peace and happiness. Okay, so I'm guessing that means he's the inventor of Twitter and Facebook, and or the idea of gifting a drum set or electric guitar to a moody teenager. I love how comic booky this is. You'll never see this kind of thing said outside of a comic book or an adaptation of a comic book. War on peace and happiness. I live beneath you, but nothing is beneath me. That's, yeah, that's great. And, you know, it's it's also worth noting that when it is only Bob, the patriarch of the family, fighting by himself, he is not able to take out the super the villain, but when the rest of the family join him in super heroics, they are able to take out the villain. And, you know, I, I like the, like, Syndrome was going to raise Jack-Jack as his own sidekick out of revenge. Like, again, like, other than comic books. Oh, wait, actually, I guess maybe some people did used to do that. Like, really rich jerks. Anyway. Quoting some fellow critics here, every family member has a superpower that fits the role they have in the family, but the movie challenges the idea. You know, each of the family members has to be able to do other things and can't always be the thing they're defined by, and they need the support of the other members. And, you know, The Take did an excellent video on this aspect of the movie, and I recommend that. In, in general, they make excellent videos. So, let's see. 
Yeah, and, and some have said that Syndrome is a comment on toxic fandom, which makes sense. I don't really have anything to, to add to that. Um, yeah, it makes sense. Now, I want to know what is your favorite comic book movie? Put it down in the comment section. And maybe also write, like, if there's something you thought could have made this movie even better. Or, you know what, if you don't like this movie, if you want to make your case for why it's, like, overrated or something, you know, I, I want to read it. And, yeah, that's it for this video. If you like this video, please comment, thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page, one, two, or more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video for you to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie and one talking about my spoiler thoughts about the most recent episode of the current Disney Plus MCU shows, which these days is Moon Knight, as well as one talking about my spoiler thoughts on the episode of The Mandalorian that I've personally finally gotten around to watching. And recently, the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you want more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch my video next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as well as I enjoyed watching recording. And I'll catch you next time.